Welcome to Bible Insights. This is Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, how can a person be right with God? The basic religious question is, how can I have access to God? How can a person get into a right relationship with God? A more biblical way of stating it is, how can a sinful person be right and acceptable with a holy God? Although this question has been asked by millions, today it is seldom voiced, and yet people still ask it, at least in their hearts. The major reason behind the silence of the question is because men and women are so far away from God that for the most part, they're even ignorant of the fact that they are separated from God. They have no concept of sin. They have little feelings of remorse. There's no awareness of the righteousness and holiness of God. And until a person recognizes their sins and also the holy majesty of God, they see no need to be justified or to be made acceptable with God. A study of the law of God, that is the principles of right and wrong found in the Bible in both Old and New Testaments, will often uh, carry a person, uh, enable a person, to see just how far apart from God they really are. This is one of the basic purposes of God's moral law. Once a person sees his rebellion and his acts of transgression, he may once again ask this all-important question, how can I be right with God? He asks it because he realizes that he's all wrong within himself, that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need a revival of a deep sense of God's holiness and majesty, and at the same time we need a revival of the sense of our own utter bankruptcy before him. The realization of God's wrath upon sin is necessary for us to gain a proper perspective on the urgent spiritual needs. Although people today often deny or at least suppress the question of how a person can get right with God, they continue to ask it on their own hearts, especially in times of crisis. And there are many proposed answers to this question. For as soon as a person realizes he stands in need of a spiritual relationship with God, he begins to construct his own bridges to span the gulf. The Apostle Paul mentions at least four of these human failures to achieve salvation in his autobiographical remarks in Philippians chapter 3. As Paul looks back on his life before he became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and describes his search for a living faith, he tells us of the things he once relied on to make himself right with God. Here's what he wrote, Philippians chapter 3. Watch out for dogs, used metaphorically. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh, although I once also had confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that's in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain for me, I considered it to be a loss because of the Messiah. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. So let's look at what he says. First, he mentions race, heritage, national, ethnic, cultural. He said that he was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a member of the chosen race, and he had all the advantages of background and heritage. 
As a child, he'd been taken to a place of worship regularly. He'd been taught to believe in the one true God. He would have had the scriptures read to him, memorized vast portions of it. Despite all of these external advantages, they did nothing to alter the fact that he was a descendant of Adam. He too had been born in Adam's fallen image, inheriting a fallen nature, and thus in the wrong with God from the beginning, as he expressed it in Romans 5.12. By one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. What was true of Paul is also true of you or me. No matter your racial or religious background or how devout your parents or your ancestors, the fact remains that they and you were born in a state of sin, morally corrupt and away from God. None of these advantages of race or ancestry can make a man or woman or child right with God. Paul then turns to the second bridge, religious ritual. He was a devout Jew, born of God-fearing parents. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, this ancient Jewish ceremony was an important sign of God, of God's blessings upon Abraham and upon Abraham's descendants, physically as a chosen nation and ultimately spiritually as those who share the faith of Abraham. To Abraham... It spoke of God's grace and forgiveness. But the outward and the visible sign does not automatically guarantee an inward spiritual condition of peace with God. The fact that one was a descendant of Abraham physically and was in the chosen nation did not equal righteousness before God. They also had the faith that Abraham had in the God who justifies. Now, there's a whole system of practice, a a whole philosophy of religion known as sacramentalism. It is the belief that a person is made right with God by going through the proper ritual. If you are in the least religious, you have probably participated in or witnessed at least one or more of these events. There's such things as baptism or christening, confirmation, penance, the mass, Now, all truly biblical ritual has its place and deep significance. And what is commanded in the Bible to be done should be conducted with the people of faith in the Lord Jesus. The trouble is the man goes beyond God's work and God's word and distorts the meaning of God's true sacraments, his ordinances of grace. Instead of looking in personal faith to God in Christ, They depend on the ritual itself. It is so common to believe that God has made a way of salvation to which man connects at baptism and must remain connected by all the other ceremonies or law-keeping, the keeping of days, the keeping of rituals. These rituals are looked upon as God's instruments of salvation. Such is a false idea. You can be christened as a child, confirmed as a teenager, and be a regular attender at all the religious ritual and still miss God completely. The mere acts of an outward ceremony cannot change a sinful heart, and not one ritual was ever ordained to do so. The two New Testament ordinances are baptism or immersion in the name of the Lord, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Lord's Supper for the remembrance of Christ's one sacrifice on the cross. And they are for believers only, and they speak of the grace of God in salvation. There's a third bridge that people try to construct in order to bring them to God. We could classify it as religious practice. Paul said that he was a strict Pharisee and tried as hard as he could to follow all the old traditional rules of his religion. He practiced his faith with sincerity and zeal. Now, God had given at least 10 commandments in the commandments from Mount Sinai, and there are at least 630 mentioned somewhere in the Old Testament. But to these, the religious leaders of the centuries had added hundreds or even thousands. And one day, by God's grace, Paul realized that, and he counted everything apart from Christ as useless. Remember this. 
A man is not justified, he says, by the works of the law. No person can be religious enough nor perform enough religious acts to be counted righteous before God. Paul also addresses this same topic in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, and Romans chapter 8, 1 through 4. I urge you to look them up and read them. This does not mean you should not go to church or read the Bible or be baptized or give to the Lord's work. You should do all these things, and people of true faith will so participate in the faith. But it does mean this. You must not do these things to earn favor with God. Instead, they are to express the inward reality of a restored relationship with God by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. One last bridge Paul mentions is that people hope they can build by themselves to reach God is the bridge of character or respectability. Paul was outwardly blameless. When people looked at his outward life, they said, whoa, that's a holy man. But he learned that inwardly he still stood naked before God. Now, you should be clean. You should lead a good, upright, and generous life. But don't depend on this to make you right with God. When you are measured by God's standard of righteousness, and that's the only standard that counts, inwardly and outwardly, then you will see just how far short you really are. It doesn't matter how you stack up in relationship to your fellow man. You're still way behind when it comes to the standard of God, and that's the only standard of righteousness that counts. The Bible has a simple and yet a profound answer to this question. So if, if a man or a woman cannot reach God because of their background or their race, their culture, or their participation in baptism or other religious rituals or religious zeal and sincerity, good character, you ask the question, even the apostles ask him, who then can be saved? Well, the Bible has a simple and yet it is a profound answer. The Bible is very clear that we're to seek our salvation outside of ourselves. All self-centered and self-generated religion will utterly fail. All man-made devices to reach God will prove to be futile, inadequate. God must build the bridge between himself and sinful people. The bridge to God is the Lord Jesus Christ by means of his perfect life, his sacrificial death on the cross, his physical resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, and in him, his person and his deeds alone. If a person is to be right with God, they must be justified by the free grace of God alone through faith in Jesus Christ the Lord alone. No other foundation will do. Justification by grace through faith is the one indispensable way of restoring a guilty sinner to the heart of God and it's on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ it's a righteousness outside of you that God gives to you as a gift. He credits it to your account because of what Christ has done. And then he works in you by his blessed Holy Spirit to conform you to the image of your Savior. It is on the basis of Jesus' atoning death for sinners that God will accept you. You must repent of your futile way of thinking and your self-centered way of living. This is what the Bible calls sin. And you must deposit your faith in the living Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And when you do, God will declare you righteous in Jesus. He will forgive you all of your sins, past, present, and future. And he will give you the gift of eternal life and a promised, guaranteed future of happiness and glory everlasting. Oh, here he's called to you. Believe 
on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. And the next time, remember that God's the one who builds the bridge and the bridge is the Lord Jesus.